That is our prayer. That is our desire that you would ever be before us, that we would fix our eyes on you, that our hearts would be stayed on you, that you would be our ruler. We know that you are a benevolent master, a wonderful Lord, a righteous king. And Lord, we also recognize that the only way for you to be our Lord and for us to be in fellowship with you is because of what you have done in your son, Jesus. And so, Father, we greatly rejoice in you and we come with thankful hearts, with humbled hearts, knowing what we deserve. Help us to know better. Help us to know more intimately your love, your mercy, your compassion, your great work in the gospel. And let that knowledge feed our faith that would produce obedience and devotion to you that you would be glorified in every part of our life. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You can open up your Bible to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to take a, a brief break from Mark as John is out of town this weekend, and we're going to just parachute into a few verses from 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning. This morning, we're going to look at the outpouring of a worshipful heart. We're going to get insight from a man who has contemplated the greatness of the salvation that has been given to him from God through Christ. And this declaration of praise is of great spiritual value because it is founded upon God himself. And this refrain is a fortifying refrain that prepares and encourages one for whom these truths are true to praise and to worship and to remain steadfast in all circumstances. The realities that are communicated evoke songs of praise to God in all circumstances. The realities in this passage demonstrate that if all else in the world were to be stripped away, what we have received from God in Christ is more than enough. Peter is writing these things and proclaiming these wonderful realities, not because all is well for his hearers, but rather because they are in the furnace of trials and persecutions. And yet these glorious realities transcend temporal circumstances and present sufferings and afflictions, and they give unshakable hope and assurance for the believer, even in the midst of the most intense trial, even in the midst of the deepest sorrows and most difficult sufferings. There is always occasion for praise in the life of the believer. There is always occasion for hope. Have you ever been faced with a trial and thought, I'm not quite sure I can do it? I'm not sure I'm going to make it. Or watched someone else go through a hardship and wondered, would my faith be enough? I don't know if I could make it through something like that. Peter's going to communicate wonderful truths and answer these questions for the believer. And the answer for the believer is a resounding, yes, you can endure. And yes, even in the darkest of times and the deepest of struggles for the believer, even in a weak, fledgling faith, They will endure, and not only will one who is truly in Christ be able to get by and endure in the midst of trials and hardship and persecutions, but they can worship and praise and rejoice. Let's look together at God's word. 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read verses 3 through 9. Peter says, starting in verse 3, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. In verse 3, Peter begins this section saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This word for blessed is, is to praise. It's to speak well of. It's where we get our English word for eulogy. Here it's a declaration of praise and worship. And Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This blessing is to God, the Christian God, the God and Father of Jesus Christ. This isn't praise to an unknown God or undefined God. This is worship of the God of the Bible, the God of Scripture, the Father of Jesus Christ. And in this blessing is a declaration of praise that communicates subjection, trust, adoration, worship. And everything that follows is occasion for this blessing that is given to God. And so as we watch this passage unfold, what we find are three reasons to give unyielding praise to God in every circumstance. Peter here is blessing God. He is praising God. And as he explains further beyond this blessing, we'll find three occasions to praise God in every circumstance. Three reasons to give unyielding praise to God in every circumstance. The first, the first reason to give unyielding praise to God in every circumstance is this, the gift of a merciful rebirth. Why can we give unyielding praise to God? Is because of, number one, the gift of a merciful rebirth. Look again at verses three through five. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The main idea here in these verses is found in the statement, has caused us to be born again. And this is referring to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has caused us, those who are believers in Christ, the Christian, he has caused us to be born again. God, the one worthy of praise, has done this. This is salvation language. And it is clearly God's doing. To be born again is regeneration. And this is the same language that Jesus used with Nicodemus when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is a spiritual rebirth that is initiated and executed by God himself. You and I had nothing to do with our physical birth other than we were there. And God is the initiating and active agent in your spiritual birth as well. Not only did you have nothing to do with causing your rebirth, but the very fact that God would take this action is in keeping with his great mercy. His mercy. 
Not only could you not save yourself, I could not save myself, but in order for God to save you, it demanded a great mercy. This was a merciful act. You did nothing to merit this rebirth. You did nothing to initiate this rebirth. God did it. God caused it. God does this work creating for the believer new life. And this mercy that he, that he bestows on one whom he chooses and does this act, this mercy is in keeping with his compassionate nature. This is in full keeping with his character. We were helpless. We were godless. We were sinners. We were enemies of God at enmity with him. And yet God intervened. God caused us to be born again. God has given to us an amazing gift of a merciful rebirth. And Peter describes what comes with this rebirth. Peter says, you've been born again to a living hope. Do you see that in verse 3? The believer is given new life from God in his rebirth and has been born to a living hope that is founded upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look again at verse 3. Who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope summed up in Christ cannot fail and cannot fade because it, because it is grounded upon Jesus himself. It cannot fail. It cannot fade because it is grounded upon Jesus who overcame death. God's salvation work in Christ is truly captivating. And the apex of his saving and redemptive work and the very foundation of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the believer has hope in this rebirth. And the hope that Peter is speaking to isn't a wishful thinking kind of hope. That's not hope as scripture puts it forth. It is a sure assurance. It is a certainty. It is a bold confidence, a certain reality. And this hope is a living hope. This hope has the solid rock foundation of being founded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so this new birth gives us a certainty of fellowship with God, forgiveness of sins, freedom from sins, bondage, eternity with our great God. And the confidence we have in this hope is founded upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no greater agent for bringing about a secure hope than the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, conquering death, defeating death. As he went to the cross, the perfect Lamb of God, the righteous substitute, had the holy wrath of God poured out on him, was made sin, the one who knew no sin. And in his absorbing of God's wrath and de defeating of death, now us who are guilty receive a righteousness not our own. Because Christ took our sin. And so as we consider this rebirth that is brought about by God, that God caused, we can have a living hope because our hope is founded on a living Savior who overcame death. What a wonderful, precious reality for the believer to rejoice in. And then look again at verse 4. He caused us to be born again, not only to a living hope, but, verse 4, to obtain an inheritance, inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. Another reality of this merciful rebirth is that we were reborn to an inheritance. God saved us to a portion. And Peter describes this inheritance. He, he lists characteristics of this inheritance. First, we see it is imperishable. 
This inheritance will not decay. Neither moth nor rust can touch this inheritance. No one can take it away. No one can plunder it. It's an undefiled inheritance. It won't spoil. It is free from stain or blemish. You cannot pollute this inheritance. It will not fade away. It is unwithering. It won't deteriorate over time. This inheritance will never perish. This inheritance will never become less valuable. It will never diminish or lose its charm. And it is reserved for you in heaven. This reserved is that it is, it is guarded. It is kept safe by God himself. It's watched over, and then Peter says it is, it is reserved for you, that is, believers who are protected by the power of God. Do you see that in verse 5? It's reserved in heaven for you, and then verse 5, who are protected for the ones that God has caused to be born again, there is an inheritance. And those whom God has caused to be born again are those whom are protected by God's power. The inheritance is being watched over by God, and the believer is being protected by the power of God. The inheritance and the inheritor are both being cared for under the divine power of the living God, which again only solidifies this certain hope that we have in Christ Jesus, that absolutely should lead us to blessing our great God and praising Him. God's power is unmatched. Nothing competes with God's power. God himself is omnipotent. That is all-powerful. All things were created by his power. All things are sustained by his power. It was by his power that Jesus was raised from the grave, and it is by God's power that one is reborn, and it is by God's power that one is kept. So to be protected by God's power is to be guarded by that which everything else is subjected to. Now, for the believer, facing trials, facing hardship, facing persecution, facing sorrows, what a comfort And what a confidence can you have? Not in your own ability to press forward, but in the divine power that God keeps his own with. When Peter says protected, he's using a military term depicting to be shielded or or to be kept. And this is a continuous activity in which God actively assures the safety of those who are his. There is no more sure power, no more sure power than to be protected by God's power. And there is no rival power that threatens God's power. All of this up to this point has been God's doing. And then look at what Peter says next. Look at verse 5. Who are protected by the power of God through faith. Faith is the means that activates God's preserving power in the life of the Christian. God secures our faith, so it remains the agent of his power for our protection. We entrust ourselves to God in faith. We have an obligation to do so. God causes us, independent of us, to be born again. And as he does that saving work and grants to us faith, we are to exercise that faith intentionally, dependently, and God's divine means for keeping us under his power is that very faith that he gives us. We entrust ourselves to God in faith. We have an obligation to do this. We are called to do so, and yet our exercising of faith is not independent of God. Rather, God secures it so it remains the agent of his power that keeps us. How are we kept? 
It is exclusively through the power of God. And how has God chosen to exercise that power? It's through the agent of our faith. And for God's power to be connected to our faith, it doesn't create some sort of equal sharing in what God does in salvation. As if God is dependent on us being full of faith. God is the one who grants it. Salvation from start to finish is God's work to save us, to sustain us. And the point here is he does this through faith. Which means if God has granted to you faith, you can have confidence in that faith that though it feels feeble and frail and even fluttering at times, if it is true faith, it will endure. Because God's faith does not fail. He is faithful. God secures our faith so it remains the agent of his power that keeps us. Though it be fragile, fickle at times, and even as weak as our faith may seem, what we see here, what we'll look at even more shortly, is that genuine faith is always an enduring faith. And for God's power to be connected to our faith doesn't doesn't create an opposition to what God wants to do in us through that. This is so comforting and so freeing, especially in the face of adversity. And then look at what he says regarding this merciful rebirth in verse 5 again. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This protection by God's power through faith is for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. God's salvation that he grants to the believer is sure and true, but the fullness of that salvation is being kept by God. It is ready, and it will be revealed or uncovered or unveiled. God will will draw back the blinds on the fullness of his salvation purposes for his people. when Christ returns in glory. God will draw back the blinds on this salvation when Christ returns in glory and believers will with him be manifested in glory. The sure reality of what God has done for the believer will be unveiled in all of its splendor on that day. What a gift this rebirth is. If you're a Christian, God's mercy has been poured out on you. It has brought you from spiritual death to life. It has secured you to a living hope that cannot die. It cannot fade away. It has brought you to an an eternal inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled. You are under the protection of the power of God with a glorious fullness of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Apart from Christ, if you do not know Christ, you are dead in your sins, you are under condemnation in your own misery, you have no hope in this life or beyond, you have nothing and can attain nothing that will last beyond this life, you have no access to any power to change any of this on your own, your only hope is that God would do this work in you. This gift of salvation is unlike anything else and has a direct impact on how everything in your life is viewed, understood, navigated. And Christ calls you to repent and believe. How do you know? If you're here this morning and wondering, Well, God has to do it, so I guess I just sit back and we'll see if he does it. That's not how God works. When he causes you to be born again, you repent and you believe. And so I urge you, repent and believe. Place your faith in Christ. Let what God loves to do in sinners take effect in your life. Be reborn. Be caused to be reborn. (laughs) By submitting your life to faith in Christ. 
experience all these blessings that come that are occasion for praise and worship of God. No other reality has a greater bearing on your life than this reality. For those who have received this gift of rebirth, blessing from God and praises to God are absolutely appropriate. What else could we do when contemplating these truths? But worship and praise God, regardless of what else is going on in our life. So the first reason to give unyielding praise to God is the gift of a merciful rebirth. Next, the second reason to give unyielding praise to God is the treasure of a tested faith. Number two, the treasure of a tested faith. Peter has just laid a rock foundation, a solid rock foundation, upon which endless praise must flow. But we all know it is not particularly difficult to praise God when things are going well. Where it is especially difficult is to praise God when in the midst of trials. It's much more difficult when in the midst of persecutions, sorrows, trials, difficulties. And so what we see is that the glorious truth of the rebirth for the believer directly impacts how one who has been born again suffers in this life. When the reborn one is tested, when trials hit, it is not an obstacle to what God would want to do in and through the believer. Rather, God has specific purpose in it, and the rebirth given is actually all the more occasion to praise in the midst of adversity, so that the, the testing of their faith, the expression of faithfulness in trial, is occasion to continue in unyielding praise to God. Look at verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. And I believe P Peter here is referring to all of the salvation realities that he has just set forth in these verses. What he's just spoken of in verses 3 through 5. In this, you greatly rejoice. A defining characteristic of the believer is joy. And what's interesting is what Peter is about to talk about regarding trials. In these salvation realities, you greatly rejoice. Even in the midst of testing, in the midst of trials. For the believer being secured by God's mercy and kept by God's power through faith doesn't find trials a threat. They're not in opposition to the aim of the Christian's life. It's not a, an obstacle to the agenda of the believer to endure hardship. True faith perseveres and endures. And so trials actually only demonstrate the reality of that faith, which for the believer is absolutely invaluable. True faith will always endure to the end. Therefore, a trial, a hardship, a difficulty isn't a threat to who you are as a child of God. Every trial only puts on display the reality of your faith, which gives you a full assurance and a confident hope of what is yet to come. For the believer being secured by God's mercy and kept by God's power through faith doesn't find trials an obstacle. True faith perseveres, it endures, and so trials actually only demonstrate the reality of this faith. God's means of his keeping power is faith. And so when that faith is tested and demonstrated, it is a great comfort, an invaluable reality for the believer. And Peter says, even though now for a little while you have been distressed by various trials. Do you see that in verse 6? In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. 
The recipients of this letter from Peter were facing real trials. This statement is it written living in the hypothetical. He's not saying if you find yourself in a trial, still rejoice. They're being persecuted. They're facing real hardship for their devotion to and love for Jesus. Their devotion to Christ is costing them dearly. And Peter says in this, you greatly rejoice. They rejoice in their rebirth, even though they've been distressed by their trials. For the believer who has been caused to be born again, there is no resentment in following Jesus. Only praise for the gift of being his. And Peter says, though now for a little while, And this description of time is subjective, but the reality is in light of eternity, whether your trials are for a short season or for the whole of your life here, it is a little time. It is a little while. It's momentary in light, as Paul says. Do you ever feel like your trials are unending? One trial after another trial after another hardship, one bad report. You start to gain a little traction circumstantially in this life and then another one just hits you and you feel like the wind is constantly being taken out of your sails. Take comfort. Whatever your trial that may seem relentless and unending, it's not. If you're a believer in Christ, what we see here is the ability to rejoice and the description of those trials as just a little while. If you're not in Christ, this is the best for you. Right now, it's, it's not going to get better circumstantially for you. You are under God's condemnation and judgment. And past this life, you will endure the righteous wrath of God. The hardship of this life only lasts a little while, leading to an infinitely more intense hardship of being under God's wrath, his righteous wrath. For the believer, the hardship of this life is yet passing fleeting, momentary, in light of eternity. This sure hope, this secured inheritance that we have, take heart. Take heart. Be of courage. Press on. Maintain an eternal perspective. Take comfort, friends. Whatever your trial that may seem relentless and unending, just a little while longer. And then Peter says, if necessary. In this, you you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary. This statement might be a little confusing or one you gloss over, but I found it so, so, so comforting. Believers go through trials, but they do so only when necessary. God's people are never needlessly afflicted. God has a purpose behind every one. In every trial, in every struggle, in every affliction, it only happens when necessary. Necessary for what? For God's divine providential purposes to work good in his people and to glorify himself. There is no meaningless suffering, no accidental trial. And in every trial for the believer who endures, there is the treasure of a tested faith. Every true believer will endure. It's what faith does as you are protected by God's power. And so there is no vain, purposeless suffering. 
this truth has been so comforting for my family these last seven months. As most of you know, my family has been going through a a trial, a hardship. We weren't persecuted for our faith, but we have endured sorrows that we never thought we would have to navigate. In October of last year, our five-year-old son, we have had four children, and our five-year-old son uh, passed away in a tragic accident. Under God's providential watch, it was necessary. God has purpose. He's wise. He's good. He's righteous. He's just. It's easy to question that when all we do is look at the moment. But you know what? At the greatest trial ever experienced, the most unjust event that ever took place, the climax of sin manifested on this earth when the Son of God was crucified. If all we saw that was that moment, we, what would we say? And yet God in his providential wisdom deemed it necessary. And through that atrocious act, brought about salvation for all who would believe. How much more can we trust God's wisdom in our trials? It's necessary. He's doing it for a purpose. He is wise. And that same divine power that causes us to be born and secures us in our faith is also providentially bringing all things to pass for his glory and for his people's good. Julie and my faith in this season has felt so frail at times. I've commented that at times it feels like we're hanging on by a thread. But we know it's God's thread and it will not fail. And that's where our hope lies. That's why we can have a bold confidence in God's faithfulness. We're being kept by God's power through a faith we were granted. And so in every trial and in every hardship, we find a benevolent God that providentially brings these things to pass with divine purpose in love grounded in mercy. And at times, it is still a temptation to wonder, God, is it really necessary You might be going through something right now, and in your heart, you are wrestling. Is it necessary? Yes. God only brings and allows these things to come to pass in his children's life for a purpose. It is necessary. The answer is yes, but look at verse 7. And we see a a glimpse into one of the wonderful purposes of how and why God uses trials in his people's life. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The purpose of trials is so that the proof of your faith may be found. Your faith, which is more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your faith is demonstrated as genuine. Genuine faith perseveres through trial. It lasts to the end, and so when you endure trials and your faith is tested, it is both refined and revealed as true. Like gold that is tested by fire, both to remove impurities and to reveal the purity of the gold itself, so does this testing of our faith both refine and reveal the faith of the believer. And what is the outcome? Praise and glory and honor 
Now, at first glance, you might think that the praise and the glory and honor is directed to God, and God is absolutely worthy of praise and glory and honor. We will be praising and glorifying and honoring God for all eternity. But that's not what Peter is getting at here. A tested faith that endures the believer, the the tested faith that endures in the believer brings praise and glory and honor to the believer at the revelation of Jesus. For the believer who perseveres with the tested faith, a faith that endures, they will hear the praise. Well, what praise? Well, just think for a moment. Well done, good and faithful servant. The praise of our Lord And what glory and honor awaits the believer? There's a a participation in the radiance and glory of Christ. When you see him, you will be like him. And honor. This honor as you anticipate the position God bestows on his saints and the blessings that they receive in heaven. What? Praise and glory and honor? None of these compete with God's praise. They only accentuate it as the work that God does in his children is expressed through faithfulness. But what a blessing that we have in eternity to look forward to. This faith will be found to result, this tested faith that endures. It's the only kind. Genuine faith endures. Will result... Look again at verse 7, in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Trials are not an obstacle to be avoided. For the believer, whatever trial you are in, it is necessary and it will be used in fullness to accomplish God's good plan, resulting in a tested faith that is more precious than gold. Gold is an element and does not rust, it doesn't decay, it doesn't corrode. And yet, pure gold only lasts in this world. That's the point. Think about that for a minute. This tested faith is more precious, more enduring, more valuable than gold, which is perishable. Peter was not uninformed about the reality of gold being an element. But he was looking far beyond this world only. Gold will perish like everything else in this world. Your faith, tested and pure, bears weight into eternity. And we can actually bless God, we should bless God, for the treasure that is a tested faith. This is why whether the Lord gives in this life or takes away, the constant refrain for the believer is, blessed is the name of the Lord. He is to be praised. Lastly, the last reason to give unyielding praise to God is number three, the joy of fellowship with Jesus. First, we saw the gift of a merciful rebirth. Next, we saw the treasure of a tested faith. And lastly, the joy of fellowship with Jesus. Look at verse eight. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The hymn in verse 8 is referring to Jesus Christ at the end of verse 7. Look again at verse 7. Your faith tested, through, tested by fire may be found to result in the praise and the glory and honor at the rev- revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, that is Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. The believer anticipates with eager expectation the return of Christ. But the believer also loves and believes in Jesus, has fellowship with Jesus. There is an intimate relationship with Jesus. Jesus. 
Your life is committed to him. Everything revolves around living for him. You commit yourself to him in love and you submit your life to him in faith. And this tested faith that endures is a reflection of a love for and belief in Jesus. Peter saw him. Many of his writer or of, of his readers of his letter had not. And so he says this tested faith that endures is a reflection of a love for Christ. You love him. You believe in him. You entrust yourself to him. You devote yourself to him. You see, when God causes someone to be reborn in that, there is a devotion and dependence and allegiance to Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your master. Your your life is consumed with him. And in that, You love him, and though you do not see him, you believe in him, and you greatly rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory. This is an enduring joy. This is a rock-solid joy. This is a joy that is so founded in the person of Jesus Christ that whatever the circumstances, even the testing of your faith through trials, it does not take one bit away from the joy that you have in him. You greatly rejoice because of these realities of of what God has done in your salvation, of what awaits you in eternity, of how God divinely orchestrates and uses trials, all kinds of trials, for your good, for the refining and demonstration of your faith. What greater comfort could there be to a believer than to watch God's work in you when the world has no explanation for why you would persevere and endure. It demonstrates the reality of your faith. And this faith is more precious than anything. Why? Because this faith leads to that which bears weight into eternity, your eternal fellowship with God. To know Jesus and be known by Jesus is infinitely greater than anything in this world. It is a joy beyond expression that we would know Christ this way. Peter uses the term inexpressible. You just can't describe it. You can't can't put words to it. How, How are you finding joy in the midst of fill in the blank, whatever hardship, sickness, loss, trial, persecution. How are you finding joy in that? I can't explain it. It's unlike anything in this world. And Peter says it's full, full of glory. It's a joy full of glory. I'm not sure exactly what he even means by that. It's a supernatural joy that cannot be adequately described. This is an untouchable joy. It's a joy beyond expression that cannot be touched by this world. And Peter says in verse 9, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. What Christians receive by faith in the salvation of their souls, how could we not praise? How could we not rejoice? How could we not bless our great God? Loving and believing in Jesus, this kind of faith and fellowship with Christ obtains, it presently gives to you the salvation of your soul. A constant, present deliverance from the penalty and the power of sin. 
The work of faith is a clinging to Jesus in love and belief, a treasuring Jesus above all else, a living for Jesus above all else, a trusting in Jesus above all else. And in this we find the outcome of this faith is salvation of your souls. You are saved from God unto God through Jesus Christ. How could we do anything other than give unyielding praise to God in all of our circumstances? And then to press forward. One step at a time, I trust, I love my Savior, I believe in Him, and I worship God. Let's pray. Lord, we marvel at your goodness. We thank you for your great work in salvation to give spiritual life where there was only death. We know we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but for those whom you saved, you've caused them to be born again, and in this we have a living hope. We have Christ. Help us. We believe, but help us in our unbelief where we struggle and where we falter, help us to fix our heart and our minds on these wonderful, glorious realities that are occasions and causes and reasons to praise at all times, to bless your name, to worship you, and help us to believe that a life yielded to you in faith is better than anything else that this world could offer. That a faith in you is more precious then all the riches, all the fame, all the successes, all the comforts that we could ever experience in this life. And thank you for your providential wisdom and perfect design in salvation that we don't have to wait for something down the road to find benefit in you. There is joy inexpressible in you for each believer today. Not giddiness, not a flippant, happiness, regardless of our circumstances, but in the midst of the most excruciating pain, there is joy. In the most intense disappointments in this life, there is confidence in you, and we have joy. Help us. Help us to believe. Sustain us by your power. Be glorified through our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.